We're good. Good morning. I'd like to call to the order the uh, Board of Agenda meeting for May 5th, 2020. And could I get a roll call, please, of uh, the board members? Emily? Ms. Oates? Here. Mr. Fox? Hi. Here. Ms. Colors? Here. Mr. Mabe? Here. Mr. Carter? I don't believe he's here yet. Could we all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item on our agenda is the adoption of the agenda. Are there any additions or deletions? And um, while we're while I'm talking, I've got the um, I've got I've got the, um, the town council work session meetings from last night. I'd like to spend just a couple of minutes on um, looking at looking at those and just making a few comments. And just would like everybody in our board to hear it. Um, so I'd like to adopt or have a discussion on um, the proposed audio and video system. Mr. Chairman, I move that we adopt the agenda as presented with the addition of what you've just mentioned. Is there a second? I'll second that. Is there any further discussion? Could I get a roll call, please? Mr. Main? Yes. Ms. Colors? Aye. Mr. Fox? Aye. Ms. Oates? Aye. And Mr. Carter is happy. One motion carries. Are you going to put that under new business or? It'll be the item C on the work site. It'll be under item C on the work site. Next is uh, the agenda public comment period. Um, Please provide comments on the agenda by the deputy clerk in advance of the meeting. Do we have any? Yes, so I received two emails for items that are on the agenda. Uh, the first is from Mr. Gary Kushner. Uh, he, the subject of his email is proposal to annex property at 3853 Guard Hill Road to the town of Front Royal with development plan for 150 garden style residential apartments and the grant application for additional fire and rescue staff. Uh, the annexation proposal is not appropriate on several levels. No additional property should be annexed from the county to the town or any political jurisdiction unless it presents an overwhelming benefit to existing citizens of Warren County. The above should be the de facto annexation policy in Warren County going forward. Approving property annexations would be an abdication of responsibility in representing the interests of current citizens. It is in their interest to retain total control over the land within the current Warren County boundaries. The current urban development plan provides that dense residential development be accomplished within town boundaries, which is generally before the two bridges. This annexation is requested so the owner can have access to the town's public water and sewer system. The property presently does not qualify for public water and sewer service under the town's current residential water policy. Without public water and sewer service, such a dense residential project would not be viable. This proposal has been denied by previous boards because it was not in the interest of existing citizens. A previous proposal involved development of 100 age-restricted garden-style apartments where now the project has been expanded by 50% without age limits, which is even less desirable. It is commonly understood that dense residential development requires more services than are offset by county taxes and fees and thus would present an additional financial burden to existing county citizens. The county budget has been burdensome for the past half dozen years, and the majority of the current board members were voted into office with a mandate to begin reining in spending. Supporting dense residential development is exactly what is not wise to that end, especially in the pandemic environment which will have a significant as yet to be determined impact on county revenues. The existing elementary school that would serve the area is already at capacity and extraordinary efforts would be necessary to address the impacts on the educational system. Guard Hill Road is already challenging with its sloped grade, twisty turning design, and limited shoulders. VDOT has estimated that this development would triple the existing vehicle trips which would neg negatively impact safety for all those who use that roadway. The proposed development would... 
triple the traffic at 345-22 intersection, it would present a negative situation. Adding a traffic control signal at that location would slow people traveling through that already challenging area and back up traffic at the end of the bridge. If the property owner wants to develop at that location, he should be limited to buy right growth. The general public does not have any responsibility to the landowner to permit him to develop the property in a manner that would result in significant financial gain at the expense of citizens. Thus, I ask that you deny the annexation request. As for the grant for additional fire and rescue staff, I oppose that effort. An analysis of the fire and rescue service calls for service would most certainly show that the staffing has already grown beyond the increase in calls. Obtaining approval of the grant would only cover additional staffing expenses for a limited period of time. Thereafter, the county citizens would then be committed to covering the full cost of the expanded positions. Public safety agencies should not be a sacred cow and be given preferential treatment when it comes to expanded services. I am not aware of what justification the department provided as a basis for expanding its staffing, but I am virtually assured it was a one-sided activity that did not take all aspects of the issue into consideration. This new board was elected to reduce government rather than increase it. Staff positions are the most significant part of the county budget and expanding positions should only be done on the absolutely necessary basis. Grants should be used for one-time expenditures like the periodic replacement of expensive equipment such as the self-contained breathing apparatus and heart monitors. That appropriate use of grant application does not have long-term negative budget implications and thus I request that submission of this grant application not be approved. Thank you for considering my comments. And next we have an email from Billy Robinson. Uh, hello all, I became aware that the board will be discussing the Ramsey property on Guard Hill Road at the upcoming work session and of Mr. Ramsey's request to allow the county to annex the land to the town. I want to express my strong opposition to this and urge you to not allow this to happen. This is like the Crooked Run West deal last year all over again. I've lived off of Guard Hill Road my entire life and trust me when I tell you this would be a terrible and dangerous location to put all those apartments in high-rise buildings, which I think would also go against the compensation plan by distorting our skyline views. There is no way Guard Hill Road can handle that huge influx of traffic no matter what is done to the road or how many traffic lights are installed. The grade of the road is very steep there and the road cannot be widened through the area because of major drop-offs and private properties to name a few reasons. We also gave the town 600 acres five years ago and they have done nothing with it. Don't give them any more. The town doesn't have the super capacity for any development like this, nor do I think they have the funds to do any major project based on recent decisions. Maybe we should focus on getting them to pay for their police station. Mr. Ramsey has made a ton of money selling dirt from that property to build the new bridges and road and was paid to allow them to dump God knows what from the old bridge. If you talk to people outside of county employees, I think you will not like what you hear about Mr. Ramsey. He is an arrogant person who thinks if he throws enough money in someone's face, he can get what he wants. Don't let him or anyone else within the county push you around like they have previous boards. I hope you will consider what I've said and tell him no to annexing the property and no to a high density development. Thank you for your time. And I haven't received any additional comments. Thank you. Is there any Tony, I'm sorry, I'm late. Good morning, Tony. Is there anyone else in the audience that might like to speak? I, I don't see anybody additional. And I did do a call for agenda public comments in the live chat, and no one has commented. Thank you. Uh, the general public comment period is now closed. Next on our agenda is the report from the Department of Transportation, and I know Mr. Carter is on a uh, important phone call and Mr. Stanley is going to re read his report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so, report from Mr. Carter and VDOT uh, for maintenance. <clears throat> they opened up and cleaned pipes with VDOT equipment on Route 619 and 622. Uh, used the pipe flusher on Route 619 and in the Hensel Stone subdivision. Performed ditching in Hensel Stone subdivision and spot ditching and shoulder repairs on Route 613, 627, 609. 637, 721, 702, and 678, and we'll be ditching routes 613, 622, and 649 later this month. Graded various non-hard surface roads in the county and will continue this month. Completely restoned approximately 50% of non-hard surface roads in the county with available funds. And I would note, I believe that, uh, you know, VLA, like a lot of state agencies have been hit with uh, potential budget cuts or restrictions with the COVID uh, pandemic and uh, so they've probably going to lose some of their available funding for maintenance even though they had 
extra funny because of the lack of snowfall. Um, Swept sidewalks and bridges, river bridges, Route 34522 and 34522 Park and Ride will continue with bridges on 340 South this month. Remove 12 hazard trees on Route 55 West. Perform pothole repairs on various routes and will continue this month. We'll be doing asphalt patching on Route 619, 678, and 649 this month as weather permits. We'll be performing a pipe replacement on Route 643 this month. Rural Rustics uh, began tree trimming operations on Route 623 and will complete this month and move to Route 613. Uh, note the current COVID-19 pandemic has greatly slowed the economy and VDOT's revenue forecast is severely impacted, which in turn impacts the secondary six-year plan. VDOT will not know until late May or early June what those impacts are. As soon as they have some uh, an updated forecast, they'll be able to meet with the board and discuss our proposed six-year plan. Um, board issues, ramp widening and restripe in exit 13. The widening and restripe of exit 13 westbound off-ramp should be completed by the end of June. And that's a project Mr. Childress has been working with VDOT on for a couple years. Uh, VDOT has to provide a paved shoulder in order to create a right turn lane there at the signal. Uh, from time to time, especially the afternoon PM peak, you get some backups uh, back up, up towards the interstate, and that's one of the issues we're trying to improve uh, capacity there at the uh, exit. So uh, I can be able to reach out if there are any questions from the board members uh, to Mr. Carter. I'd just like to make a comment, if you will. I, out my way on Fort Valley Road, they start putting down gravel, uh, tar and fine gravel, and it looks like it's doing a tremendous good job. It's really nice the way that the improvement that's being made out there. Ms. Colors, uh, he said, I've seen Ms. Colors' questions that you had emailed him, and he said, I'm preparing, preparing a response. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Stanley. A uh, report from the Virginia Cooperative Extension Office. Uh, is Corey Childs available? Uh, he mentioned that he would rather present the board or his report in person. So I believe at the next quarterly meeting, you know, hopefully we will be back in person. But he was unable to make the call this morning. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next is a report from uh, Taryn Logan on the COVID-19 uh, expenditures for Warren County. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Taryn. The planning department has been tasked with the collection and submittal of the county's COVID-19 related expenditures for federal reimbursement. Um, as you know, the president declared a national emergency on March 13, 2020, and this authorized for the reimbursement of Category B, which is Emergency Protective Measures under FEMA's Public Assistance Grant Program, and it permits the Commonwealth to request direct federal assistance um, to fulfill a specific gap or need related to COVID-19 at a 75% federal cost share. Um, I sent you over my report yesterday, but just to go over it, um, each department has been tracking their expenses and providing that information to um, my department to coordinate and submit to VDEM. The submittal periods are quarterly. Um, the first period covered January 20th through March 31st, 2020. Um, most of our county expenses did not start occurring until like late February. Um, so the departments are still gathering their related documentation, which is pretty specific. Um, receipts, credit card statements, um, where it shows they paid for that, for those items, um, check copies of the credit card statement that was paid, what was paid, um, timesheets, pay rates, contracts, um, so everybody's still gathering their information. For now, I do have an estimated total through mid-April. Um, these expenses, which I've, I've broken down per, per the departments that I've, that I've heard from as of now, um, the expenses, <clears throat> a lot of purchase um, of per personal protective equipment, disinfectants and cleaning supplies, deposit for the alternate care facility, emergency child care center costs, thermal shelter costs um, this far, and labor overtime costs associated with COVID-19. Um, so I included the table for each department. I have, um, I do have a lot of detailed information um, in my office for most departments. Some of these are still just estimated costs, um, and I don't have the total detail yet. But 
Um, but many thanks to Rick Farrell for his guidance um, and uh, working with our VDEM rep and to the county departments and agencies for their cooperation with tracking this reimbursement information. Like I said, it, it is just beginning. Um, we're just beginning to get the calls together. Um, we do have to, it's very specific how we have to fit them into cost categories for FEMA. Um, the supplies and materials, equipment, contracts, and labor. Um, and thanks to Jody, she's been calculating the benefit rates of employees, um, you know, who will be receiving overtime for the COVID. And um, Patty at the Sheriff's Department, we, we kind of started with the Sheriff's Department. And so we had their submit already at March 31st, and we were able to submit their labor um, and their materials for that first quarter. And now we're working through all the other departments. So um, it's a process, but we'll continue moving forward with that collection in the middle of it. And I'll be continuing to give the Board of Supervisors an update. And maybe in the future reports, I can give you, you know, a little more detail per department. But some of these is just an estimate of the total cost so far. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. I have a couple if no one else does. Yeah, I have one. <laughs> okay. The, uh, the foreign rescue, I assume that's just an estimate for the time being of the 25000 Yep, the 25000 was an estimate for fire and rescue, and that's for supplies and labor. Um, so I don't have that breakdown of that department yet. Okay, thank you. My question was going to be, Taryn, um, are we going to get an itemized uh, detail report I can of all these? I can, I'd be happy to provide that to you. Like I said, I don't have every department yet, um, but I have, but some of, but most of them actually do already have itemized. So um, I can provide that for you next, the, the next report. For, for FEMA, I have my overall spreadsheet which breaks it down per department. And then for FEMA, for each cost category, we have to submit a cover sheet which breaks down every every item, you know, every expense and what it was for. So it might be easier for me just to give you, you all copies of that cover sheet that, um, that, that I provide to FEMA. I don't have all of those together yet for every department, um, but I will. I appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I know, I know that, uh, Taryn, that you have gotten uh, this stuff Put on, you know, placed in your um, in your planning area, but um, how much time how much time do you need to actually put together a, a little more um, uh, information as far as your report goes? I mean, um, I know that there's plenty. Of, you've got some detail, and I know that you've been putting it together and you've done a good job of doing what you've been doing. Just wonder how long it's going to take you to. Um, bring it to something that we can use and not have to have a whole bunch of questions, just see all of the detail. Well, for, for most of, probably for half of these departments, I do have itemized um, the expenditures and what they were exactly for. Some of them is just a cost estimate so far. So it really depends on when I can get all the information and and get it together in a form that's understandable. But I have I, I have a spreadsheet. I mean, I'm happy to to share with you all um, or those cover sheets for FEMA. But I would need I need a little bit more time putting those together. Yeah, I, um, I can get together the departments I have. I have county administration, um, parks and recreation, general services. Um, the schools, I have the details for the um, daycare so far. I have their first month r mileage and rates for the bus drivers, but I have to calculate that in FEMA terms. So I don't have that together as far as the cost exactly for that. Um, the Sheriff's Department, I have very detailed, you know, the first month of their labor and their expenses. I can provide you for that $8,500. Okay, thank um, you. I could get that, I mean, I can get you what I have, you know, more detail um, right within the next few days. But. Okay. Thank you very much. And Mr. Mayor, mm -hmm. if I could just add so you all understand the process, uh, for us to get federal reimbursement, we need an invoice 
we have to have the credit card statement that paid the invoice, and then we have to have the check that paid for the credit card statement. So a lot of these things that Tara is waiting on is just a matter of process because the credit card statement isn't in yet, and we can't get a check until the check is cut after the credit card statement is in. So. Yeah, I understand everything. I just wondered what type of a time frame it was going to be so we could start seeing some of these things regular. I'm not saying it's an easy process. It's not. Yeah. I just needed, sure. to, needed to know how much time that we were talking about so we could get a reasonable report. Which this is not bad, what we have. And I do have more, I mean, more information that's filtering in all, all of the time from different departments. Um, Rick, Rick had talked to the departments, you know, last week and asked for, and maybe we'll start doing a, the first Friday of each month a submittal, and then that allows me to get everything together for maybe the, a report the second board meeting. So okay. um, this is just kind of beginning. <laughs> Yeah, and I and I do understand that, and I appreciate it. Uh, next question I have is, um, how much has actually been submitted to whoever you submit to in the government? Do you have a, a actual so, dollar? So far, for, we've only uploaded. I only have the sheriff's department, um, the eighty-five, fourteen, seventy-five, and that everything but the check copy of the check that paid for the credit card statement um, so right as of now we don't even have a total package yet because we don't have all the information yet because our, our expenses just started occurring you know pretty much March maybe late February but really through March so um, so that's what I have uploaded on there's a portal that you go in and upload everything okay um, so that being said, I'm assuming that there's been no reimbursements coming in yet at all. Okay. Uh, so it's a two-part process. Uh, we upload to virginiapa.org. Virginia Department of Emergency Management has visibility on that system. They'll do a pre-approval of all localities' uh, uploads. Once that process is complete and we get the green light from VDIP, then we'll take that whole package and we have to upload it to FEMA to actually get the reimbursement. So the upload that Karen is doing now is just providing VDIP estimate, making sure that all the localities are doing the process correctly, uh, but it won't be until all the paperwork is done and VDIP does the first approval then we upload it to FEMA to actually get our money back. Okay. Right. I don't know if y'all knew that was Rick Farrell. He, mm -hmm. He's helping Taryn uh, immensely on this. And it's a good team effort. And I appreciate the uh, just the common sense approach of how this, how this is explained. So uh, I thank you. I don't have any other questions. Anybody else? I'm just gonna make the statement. So Taryn will be giving another update in two weeks. Like uh, uh, she stated, we're gonna try to get on a the regular cycle so we can close out one month that gives her a couple weeks of time to pull things together to be able to give the report um, and talking with the chairman I wanted to get on the agenda as soon as possible realizing it's kind of half half put together because we didn't have all the information for this month but uh, moving forward uh, hopefully we'll have uh, additional information to be able to provide thank you anyone else have anything Next thing on our agenda is the, the reports from our board members. Um, Mrs. Colors, do you have anything? Uh, let's see. Just wanted, I, it was remiss, I did not realize that last week was Administrative Assistance Week, and so I want to thank our Administrative Assistants here, Kayla Dar, Shelly Hayes, Emily Shiraki, and Dana, I don't know Dana's Winner. last name. Winner. Winner. <laughs> Um, also, this week, if I'm right, is Clerk Week. Is that right, Ms. Shiraki? Or am I wrong? Is it? <laughs> I, no I, I, Googled, I Googled it and it said, so I could be wrong, but thank you very much. And I apologize for not knowing it was mm -hmm. Administrative Week last week. Um, this week is also Teacher Appreciation Week, so I want to thank all the teachers out there for everything that they do. Um, also, I've uh, been going to meetings out at the Rivermont Fire Department. Um, that process is uh, 
the buildings up and it's an amazing building continuing to check on roads take calls and emails from residents and i apologize if i haven't gotten back to anybody i, I make every effort to get back as soon as i can this weekend is mother's day so to be ahead of the game since i've been behind the game a little on some of these things just want to say uh, happy mother's day in advance for all the amazing mothers I've been blessed. Uh, my daughter and my daughter-in-law, my daughter Emily and my daughter-in-law Ashley are amazing moms. So I appreciate that. Um, and I think that's it for me. Mr. Fox? I uh, just want to report that I did visit the Riverman Fire Department and took a, a short tour, a walkthrough, if you will. And uh, it seems to be coming along very nice. It's going to be a wonderful building. And I'm sure that the department are going to appreciate it tremendously. Uh, also, I, uh, though I didn't join the liaison meeting yesterday, I, I listened to it on the uh, on the inter internet, and that's all I have. Mr. Carter. Yeah, just a second, please. Yeah, I um, reason I was late. I was getting donuts. Actually, I was out back um, meeting George McIntyre from the Apple House, and he sent you all these goodies. Wow! And I was, I guess we were charged by the chair to try to come up with some positive things in each of our districts. So that's what I was working on. Um, <laughs> donuts is always positive. That's right. <laughs> and, uh, it didn't get any better. <laughs> George McIntyre and his daughter uh, Katie. Um, run the Apple House, a family-owned business. It's been there for as long as I can remember. And with the um, uh, shutdown of some of these businesses, they've uh, found an opportunity. And what they've been doing is um, sending donuts throughout the area, in the state, and I think the country. And what they do is they package them in, in a box like this with some decorative artwork and also inside of the package is a brochure uh, of Front Royal Warren County. So that goes all over the place. And they're doing very well with that. They, they uh, can barely keep up with their orders, but you can go online to the Apple House and um, place your order. I think you can also pick them up curbside if you're here in town. Uh, but they've been very successful with that. They found an opportunity in, in this until they're able to open again. Uh, and then that's the thing too, we need to support obviously their restaurants and some of the other businesses have been impacted as much as possible and hopefully this will um, ease up some but still be safe uh, and then the other thing too is another resident in my district uh, Beth Waller she has an organization called what matters more and she actually did a piece on that I was going to try to uh, show that but you can go on, online to our website and see that piece and um, other positive things. Her organization's been around for some time uh, before the COVID. Uh, they used to meet, I think, once a month uh, down in the middle of Maine. I don't believe they're having those meetings at this point, but if anybody knows anything, and, and she's been great as far as spotlighting positives throughout the community. She's always willing to uh, uh, interview anybody. If anybody has any suggestions on who needs to be spotlighted, uh, please give her a call. The other thing too is on a, uh, a sad note, we had the passing of uh, uh, Dr. Tripp Brad this past week. Uh, he was well known in the community. He, uh, I know he used to help out with the sports uh, physicals with the schools and things like that. Um, he's been uh, waging a tough battle for the last three years. Uh, so please keep his family in your thoughts and prayers. And that's all I have, and I'm going to get out of here. <laughs> so y'all take care. Enjoy. Don't have to keep. I, I bought another. Uh, he gave me another dozen, too. I put them out there. I think Chief Maybe's on the number 11. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you guys take care. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Thank Appreciate you. it. And Good thank stuff. you, George McIntyre and Apple House. Yes. Mrs. Oates? Yeah, I'm jealous because I don't, I'm not there to get a donut. 
Come on, guys. Uh, <laughs> Tony, uh, I expect a delivery to my house. <laughs> well, no, you don't get any. I'll, t I'll eat two for you. Thank you. Um, so the report that I have is a great one. On last Wednesday, um, I was um, informed that we had a local resident who would be celebrating a hundred and her hundred and first birthday on Thursday, April thirtieth, and her family wasn't able to celebrate her in the typical way. So um, they were looking for creative ways to celebrate this woman. And um, so I, on Thursday, April 30th, with the help of Doug Stanley and Matt Tiedrich, the town and the county joined together to celebrate the birthday of Mrs. Edith Jackson, who turned 101. Um, what we did is um, I was honored to participate along with representatives from the town, Mr. Tiedrich, Todd Jones, um, but fire and rescue, the sheriff's department, the town police department, we provided her with a parade in front of her house. We decorated cars with happy birthdays. There were blue lights everywhere. Um, it, the, her, she lives in, at Royal Arms, and so people came out to watch the parade, and there were residents who participated, and it was truly a community effort that just warmed your heart. And um, Miss Jackson's family was so thankful that they found a way that they could celebrate her uh, without potentially exposing her to, our, to the virus. Um, I would like to shout out, especially to Down Home Bakery. I called them on Thursday morning and they had a coconut cake, which is her favorite, for her by Thursday afternoon. Uh, that is a pretty amazing feat it, with about three hours or four hours notice. And, um, and I'd also um, like to thank everybody who participated and provided her with cards and celebrated her. It was truly a community effort and it was wonderful to watch. Um, I'd also like to um, reiterate what Tony said. Uh, Dr. Tripp Brad um, was a is and was a treasure to this community. Uh, he was his selfless service, his Christian love was an example to all of us, and he will be greatly missed. And my heart and my prayers go out to his family. And that's all I have, Mr. May. Thank you, Mrs. Oates. My report is with um, good news as well, um, but first off, I, I had visited Rivermont Fire Department with um, Archie at one time and uh, Mrs. Cullors at another time. Uh, had a couple of emergency management meetings, which we always have every Thursday, and we've done press conferences to go along with those. Um, I have met with some citizens that actually wanted me to come and visit them, and I was more than happy to go do that. Um, we also was part of the town session and uh, the liaison. Uh, I listened to that on the internet as well. We'd all, um, part of my good news is, is twofold. One is um, we had been I've become part of a little group that uh, has been looking for things that could help the community get do things together and be part of um, uh, a joint effort. And we've been talking the idea around of a victory garden. Uh, and we have found a location. Uh, we found some opportunity as far as getting seeds, plants, contributions to where it's not going to cost anybody any money. Um, but in the next week or so we should we should have all of that stuff finalized and we'll be opening it up to the public uh, to be about an acre big and given that that's good news so if anybody wants to be a part of it there are more than welcome to and i've also asked that um, people that are doing tomato plants pepper plants that type of stuff in their own little garden to grow an extra one or two and give it to your neighbor. Uh, it'll do nothing but uh, give good support to them and put, put some food in their stomach that they don't have to go buy. Uh, the other thing is um, we've been talking to um, a nice group of folks that are trying to do something on a Friday evening or a Saturday evening where we just get together and support our restaurants. Uh, there'll be more to come on that next week. Uh, we're trying for 
possibly next Saturday to do it if we can bring all of the plans together. Um, but that'll be that. That's good news. People are actually wanting to do good things, and that's what's important. So that's that is my report. And um, uh, Mr. Stanley, do you have a report for us? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I want to echo the comments uh, relative to uh, Dr. Trip Rad. Not only was he my physician for the past 25 years, my family's, but uh, his dedication to this community and his patients is um, unmatched. Uh, he gave a lot, and uh, we we owe him a lot in his family. So uh, our hearts and prayers go out to Jan and other members of his family. As far as the coronavirus, uh, Mr. Farrell gave me a report. We have 68 confirmed cases as of this morning in Warren County. Um, that was up, I believe, 63, I believe, yesterday. Yeah, some five. Some five. Um, again, special thanks to Rick and all the members of our local emergency planning committee for staying on top of the, the situation. Uh, county facilities remain closed to the public with staff working. Uh, we're rotating staff and teleworking. We're practical, but um, we're ensuring that the continuity of operations uh, are continuing uh, part-time employment we're advertising for part-time employees to help with mowing and maintenance of both county and school board properties um, we've advertised I think yesterday on Facebook I believe it's 14 10 per hour starting salary and I think we're looking for up to four positions you know I know uh, these are positions up to 30 hours per week um, some of our kids that are graduating they want to earn some extra money for college these are great opportunities for, for folks out there um, so please give us a call at 636-4600 if you're interested RFPs the county is currently advertising uh, property and casualty insurance for our volunteer fire companies that um, is due at the end of May and also management for the front row golf club uh, listing of the RFPs is available on our website uh, under insurance the county received a total of three proposals from for audit services uh, we have a committee that will be reviewing and make a recommendation to the board at its next meeting uh, for consideration of that. Um, we have a number of employees that are going above and beyond the call of duty to help during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, these employees are helping to make sure that we are prepared to meet the challenge facing all of us and ensuring that essential services are being provided to our citizens. Uh, at today's meeting, I would like to recognize uh, one of those individuals. Uh, Custodial Supervisor Donna Shackelford has been a critical piece in Warren County's fight to prevent the spread of coronavirus in our county-owned facilities. In addition to her regular responsibilities, she has been a strong leader for our staff in the sanitizing of buildings, ordering of PPE, and collection of cleaning equipment and supplies. We greatly appreciate Donna's tremendous efforts to keep our staff and the public safe and for always having a positive attitude and a smile on her face. Thank you, Donna, for all that you do. Mr. Chairman, that's all I have, unless there are any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Stanley. Um, Mr. Ham, uh, do you have anything from the county attorney's point of view? I do, Mr. Chairman. The General Assembly has passed House Bill 29, which is a law that specifically allows uh, localities to meet electronically. Um, I think all of our previous meetings were legal and were adopted under the uh, emergency ordinance that we had passed. However, to also comply with House Bill 29, uh, one of the requirements of that is that the nature of the emergency and the type of electronic meeting uh, be stated in the minutes of the public body. So I want our minutes to reflect that we are holding an electronic meeting using Go Google Meet, uh, we are doing that because of COVID-19. And that's all I had. Do you mind, Mr. Chairman, I had a couple questions for Mr. Stanley. No worries I at all. Please. Didn't jump in because I didn't want to overstep anybody. Thank you, um, Mr. Ham. On the uh, couple of things on the Morgan Ford Bridge, have we received the grant and the payment yet, or is we have not? Uh, actually, this week I uh, received requests for inform additional information from them. You have to do historical surveys. Uh, we're fortunate with Morgan Ford that we had a lot of that work that was performed uh, during uh, the bridge construction projects. So we've submitted copies of all that information to them. So we're in the process. Hopefully, that will be enough information for them to continue to process the request. 
and cut the check to us. But at this time, we haven't received the money and certainly will not schedule to do any work until we receive money from BDGIO. Okay. okay. Um, that was my next question. We're in the process of where we were. Um, I knew that had been going on for a long time, so I didn't know, and I didn't, I assume that's one thing the state won't cut because that's DuPont grant money that was set aside. So, um, so we still anticipate getting it, and like I said, we'll we'll hold off on the project till receipt and the money is confirmed. Okay, that was going to be a question. If it was imminent to be started in the next month, I was wondering if Mr. Fox and I and Ed somehow work Walt in because I know all three of us can't be there at the same time. Could go down look at the site because I've looked at the drawings, but I'd like to go down and actually stand and see um, because that's still such a difficult area for me to look at that drawing and, and visualize that in the current state um, so we can either I would plan be to do that I in taking a look at that if it's we yeah. to, if we don't um, have three again uh, we can tag team out so um, whether we do that this week or next week whenever it's convenient for everybody um, and if we could get that on a work session at some point to to go over it with everyone because I know this is a plan that the previous board did to get us all up to snuff on where it is and what's going to be done as well. Do we want to talk about the boat landing down Bentonville as well? The proposed um, improvements? Since that's, I mean, we can. Okay. Um, and then my other question is the issues that have arisen in the last month with Rivermont, where are we versus our meeting on Thursday? Where are we at with that? Still now? waiting on a response back from the architect and, and I guess ultimately the contractor, but uh, still have not received uh, information from the architect relative to, um, or, or both of them relative to uh, the build Coming to any yeah. question, okay. if you will, if you don't mind. Sure. Does at some point, it it just doesn't progress rapidly that mm -hmm. it, it might hold up the, the progress of the construction of the building is that well they kept saying they were ahead of schedule so okay. I haven't been told at this point that we are we're still anticipating a fall completion so um, yeah I, I think we're not there yet um, if we go a couple more weeks possibly could be but uh, we'd have to have them to the contractor to tell us that it's their responsibility to stay on schedule so yeah okay because your your architect and your warranty are your the major major concerns, and they both have to be satisfied before we should be satisfied. And we hopefully it will come to a point where it's holding up the, the progress of, of it and the time the time frame. Okay, thank you. Um, We've got the approval of the minutes. There's nine there. Do we want to do each one individually? Or should we do them individually, or can we do them as a group? So there are a few sets of minutes that I believe a couple or one of the board members were absent. So, I mean, if you wanted to adopt the, and I know that Ms. Oates and I, we had an email conversation yesterday about amending one of the sets of minutes. So, I mean, it's up to you if you would like to adopt them in their entirely in their entirety you know with abstentions as appropriate and with the amendments as Ms. Oates suggests I'm fine with that um, does anybody have any well, I'm, I haven't objections? gone over the minutes for different reasons but uh, I'm going to abstain and then perhaps revisit it at our next meeting if I, if I have a question if that's okay that's fine with me so you're going to abstain from all nine sets of minutes yeah. can we just uh, we can do we, them individually, it's fine. Can, well, can we just let the revisions be done, readdress them at the next meeting, or do they have to be adopted? They don't have to be adopted today. And okay. the revisions oh, that, that Ms. Oates had that were me too. from the last meeting. The minutes. The, okay, uh, then, then let's do that. So, a motion to postpone or table, however, till the next meeting? All right. Postpone until the next meeting. Is there a second? I second that. Any discussion? Could I get a roll call, please? Ms. Oates? Aye. Mr. Fox? Aye. Ms. Colors? Aye. Mr. May? Aye. Mr. Carter? Aye. Motion carries. Is that a turn signal? Is somebody in their car with a turn <laughs> signal on? Got a bird. <laughs> Or a wood. <laughs> oh, that was Tony. Oh, okay. 
Absolutely. Emily, this, this is Jason. Can you let me back into the oh. call? I didn't realize you were getting kicked out. I'm sorry. Please remember to mute your microphone if you're not talking. Thanks. Next item on the agenda is the is the consent agenda. Um, are there any items to be pulled for further discussion? Hearing none, is there a motion to Mr. approve Chairman, the consent I agenda? That, I move that we approve the consent agenda as presented. Is there a second? I'll second that. Any further discussion? May I get a roll call, please? Ms. Colors? Aye. Mr. Fox? Aye. Mr. Maid? Aye. Mr. Carter? Aye. Ms. Oates? Aye. I figured they were steaming. <laughs> I'm good as well. Okay. Next item on our agenda is the authorization to submit an application to the 2019 staffing for an adequate fire and rescue response grant program. Good morning, everybody. This is Brandy. Um, on May 15, 2020, the Warren County Department of Fire and Rescue Services is planning on submitting an application to FEMA staffing for adequate fire and emergency response uh, grant program, also known as SAFER. Um, SAFER was created to provide funding directly to fire departments, volunteer fire interest organizations to help them increase or maintain the number of trained frontline firefighters available in their communities. Uh, the goal of the program is to enhance the local fire department's ability to comply with staffing, response and operational standards established by the NFPA, uh, specifically NFPA 1710 and or NFPA 1720. This year's grant round will provide approximately $350 million uh, for the program and approximately 300 awards are expected to be made. Uh, the projected start date for the funding is July 1st, 2020, and the, per the period of performance is 36 months. Uh, Ward County Fire and Rescue is planning to apply for either six or 12 full-time firefighter positions. Uh, grant funding will cover the salary and benefits for new additional positions or the changing of status from part-time positions, but is not intended to supplant existing funding. Using the current salary and benefit rates for an entry level firefighter, which is a grade step six, step A, an amount of $67,595.78 will be used for each position requested. Uh, using the guidelines of the program, potential funding and match requirements um, are shown in your packet. I'll review those really uh, briefly. Years one and two, the total cost for six positions would be $405,574.68. Uh, the safer funding percentage for those two years would be 75% or $304,181.01. Um, that would leave the county cost share um, at $101,393.68. Uh, year three, that funding would change from 75% to 35%. So this uh, safer funding amount would be $141,951.13, with the county cost share being $263,623.55. Uh, years four and beyond, the county would be responsible for the, the total cost, which is the four hundred and five thousand five hundred seventy four sixty eight. Um, if we did choose to apply for the twelve full time positions, the total cost each year would be eight hundred and eleven thousand one forty nine thirty six. Um, again, as outlined with the six positions, the first two years would be seventy five percent funded by Safer, so an amount of six hundred and eight thousand three sixty two oh two, with the county cost share being. 202,787.34. Um, the third year drops to the 35% again, uh, with the safer amount being 283,902.27, and the county cost share being 527,247.09. Um, again, years four and beyond, we would be responsible for the total cost. Um, any new positions that are funded through this grant program will be assigned to fire stations based on the five year staffing plan as adopted by the Volunteer Fire Chiefs Advisory Committee and the Warren County Board of Supervisors in February of 2019. Um, included in your packet are two PowerPoint presentations prepared by Fire and Rescue um, staff. 
Options for the six firefighter positions would add dedicated staffing of two firefighters to the Rivermont Fire Station 24-7, 365. Uh, the option of the 12 new firefighter positions will add the staffing to the Rivermont Fire Station as noted um, above and also an additional six firefighter positions to the Front Royal Station, which will increase their daily staffing to four positions 24-7, 365. Um, as outlined above, the estimated local funding for the six um, option required for one year is $101,393.67. Year two is the same amount. Um, year three is $263,623.55. And years four and beyond are the $405,574.68. Uh, once the 36 month performance period is over, the county will be 100% responsible for the cost associated with each newly created position if they choose to retain them. Um, for the 12 positions, once again, the first year um, local funding cost would be 202,787.34, same for year two. Uh, year three would be 527,247.09, and years four and beyond would be 811,149.36. Um, if the county is successful in being awarded funding to implement these positions, a grant agreement will be presented to the board uh, for acceptance so that members are made aware of exactly um, what we will be committing. Uh, funding for the county's call share will come from Warren County Department of Fire and Rescue Services budget. Um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, and I believe Fire Marshal Jerry Myatico and uh, Chief maybe are they're either in the boardroom right now or they're on the line as well if you have any questions for them. I have a few questions, if you don't mind. Yes. Um, Mr. Matico, my understanding when we just talked that all six positions, if we went six, we're going to Rivermont. Now this says only two. So you're going to put the other four at Front Royal? No, all six would go to Rivermont, only two per day. Okay, two per shift. So that's to staff three shifts on our staffing. Okay, because when you read it, it sounds two of the firefighters, you know, no, so, so only six would be dedicated staffing to Rivermont, two per day for 24 hours a day. If you went to the 12 model, it would send six, six to there. Rivermont, six, six to front. Okay, Correct. reading this, it just makes it sound like two for Rivermont. Okay. I just wanted no. to clarify that. Two, two per we need shift. To, um, the other, how many of those are going to be trained for EMS? Because looking at your, um, your pie chart, EMS is our biggest call, um, so are they going to, is that going to be a qualification of the job that they're not just firefighters, that yes, they're also so med trained? Yes, that's, that's correct. Our entry level position to our fire and rescue system are not only firefighters, but also EMTs. We do not hire just firefighters, so they have to be cross trained. Okay. And in addition to that also gives us bonus points in the grant application by that as well. Okay, and the 67595, is that pay and benefits or is that base pay? That is pay and benefits. Okay, so what will their base entry at that level pay? Do you know that all pay? Thank you. The entry level annual salary for a firefighter EMT is forty two thousand eight hundred fifty five eight. Okay, thank you. Now, we had, we had a had a meeting, and I was concerned about having an emergency management person as a number seven or a number thirteen. Mm -hmm. Is there any consideration for that at all? Uh, by by going back in and, and reviewing the FEMA notice of funding opportunity, uh, these uh, positions can only be hired for entry level positions to increase fire department staffing for 50% of their workload have to be earmarked for fire suppression activities. Um, so I don't know if your vision would be able to use a entry level position for that. So we would only be able to be awarded that $42,000 number plus the benefits, the $67,000, and it would have to go into the 
increase staffing to meet the NFPA standard as we talked about. That NFPA standard looks at the mobilization of fire suppression resources. Uh, so in a nutshell, an emergency management standpoint would not increase the ability to meet the NFPA standard, so it would not be fruitful for us to apply for that in this grant request. Um, how you reappropriate staff at the close of the grant period, i.e. they give you a grant, you submit, uh, we increase our staffing model based off of the grant request. At the end of that three year period when your federal funding is over, how you reallocate that staffing is certainly up to the, the chief of the department and the board, but I don't think we would be able to get a dedicated emergency management position off of the federal funds for this grant. Okay. Thank you. Um, now, you're asking to just apply for the grant? Today, correct. We are just asking for the board to give us the ability to apply for the grant and in addition to we need a number from uh, the board on what you would support if the grant is awarded what we don't want to do is apply for the grant for 15 like we did last year no, now knowing that the economics of the COVID-19 gives us a lot of uncertainty while we could have applied for 15 it would have wasted a lot of staff resources if we came back to this body said we were approved for 15 and this body said sorry we don't have the money so what we're asking for is one the ability to apply for the grant then a projected commitment if we're awarded that grant on that certain number of people the number that you approve today is really how we craft the verbiage and the narratives of the grant so it really drives what we are applying for. But if we go for 12 and situation changes, we can either take 12, take six, or take none. You take 12 or none. You cannot take, you cannot apply for 12 and only take a portion of the grant. The government won't let you do that. Now, at the end of the grant period, you could say, all right, we took 12, we're only going to keep six, say, in year four or after. All right. That is correct. That, that is a, I can understand. That is a factual statement. Now, I know that uh, m myself, Ms. Cullors, and Mr. Mabe, Doug, and the Chief have had conversations on nobody ever wants to be put in a position of terminating an employee or letting an employee go. So that is a go for 12. We don't have the funding. Do we reallocate that staff? Um, that potentially frees up a staff position. So we increase staffing at Front Royal. Uh, one of the things we talked about is floater positions. You talked about dedicated emergency management or freeing up a staff position to go into emergency management. There's options there that if the time comes and the county is not in a financial position to absorb all 12 positions, uh, then we can certainly come back to this body with potential options and hard facts data on um, the potential of moving them to floater positions to augment part-time and overtime salaries. So versus the 405 number that we're talking about today versus absorbing that full 405 for six positions, um, if you only could absorb six out of your budget process, then what we could do is virtually say, we'll find a way to where we can reuse that position and augment some of that money for you. So you're not swallowing the full cost of the grant. Uh, and it, I can't predict where we're gonna be in four years. What I can tell you is there is a need within our department staffing model right now for floater positions to augment part-time and overtime salaries for vacations, sick leave, injuries, uh, vacancies, those types of things. So that is a potential there versus terminating an employee. We can certainly have that number when that time comes. Thank you. Dolores or Tony, do you, either one of you have a question? I don't. 
Thank you. I don't either. Thank you. I have one, Mr. May. Yes, sir. If if we were to go forward with this, what would what would be the cost to the taxpayers in increase on on the on the taxes for eight hundred eight hundred eleven thousand? If we went with the full amount. Uh, I think even uh, even at six is going to be a tax increase. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think mean, it's in. It looks, that's what it looks like here for me, being a layman on it. Right. But uh, it looks like a pretty good significant. Well, I think that the, the the one thing, and you know as well as anybody, Mr. Fox, the fact that um, whether it's building a new school and trying to accommodate the debt service, or uh, even you know when we opened the last middle school, over a couple of years we put money aside towards that operation. Whether it's six or it's twelve or it's fifteen, you have the ability over four years to put money towards that cost. Um, at the end of uh, four years, you're looking at an annual cost of four hundred five thousand uh, dollars, which is not quite a penny of real estate. But again, you've got if you have a whether it's a two, three, six, seven percent growth rate, you just you the board would have to prioritize and say, okay. We need to put probably $100,000 a year of revenue growth towards covering the $405,000 we'll have to pay out. Um, obviously, year one, you're putting out hundred one, so you've done that the, the first year. But you just have to make that commitment that you're going to fund that. The reality is uh, you're going to probably get a request for additional uh, fire and rescue staff, uh, whether you apply for the grant or not. Um, I look at it as at least you're getting uh, potentially the federal government to pay for part of that during this four-year period. Yeah. Um, again, you're not committed after the four-year period. Obviously, with the six, I know we've talked about uh, building a new station in Rivermont that we would like to be able to staff the station. They provide uh, second-due coverage for a good chunk of the town of Front Royal. They provide second-due or can provide second-due coverage for um, South Warren, mm -hmm. um, and they fill a, a need. Uh, you know, I think if you look at the um, staffing plan that Chief uh, and Jerry have put together that was presented last year, um, across the street there is a they are they're running a lot of calls and uh, what over four thousand Jerry I think and certainly you you're going to help that a little bit by having a Rivermont staffed. Um, you just got to make that determination whether you want to go and have uh, the additional funding there to provide additional staff. I worry about those staff um, being burned out and running so many calls compared to some of our outlying stations and we may have to look harder at, at shifting staff around to make sure we don't burn those folks out. Well, in some cases you're running 10, 12, 15 plus calls a day and some of our other stations run one to two calls a day um, in their first two areas. So that's just part of the process. But. Um, no matter which option you choose, the, the, the benefit is that you have a few years to be able to go into that number. I guess my question, too, is if we were to go with what's uh, being proposed in its total, could we cut back in future years once we've made a commitment to say that we didn't want to go with the full amount that's what, what so, we're... So let's say you applied for the 12 today and you got down in four years, you decided, you know what, uh, whether it's the pandemic or whatever else, that you know what, uh, we can't commit to funding an additional 800,000, but we still want to keep Rivermont staff with six 24-7. Uh, you could reduce that 12 down to six. Okay. I mean, Jerry said that, that we that's, uh, that's after the grant period. You have to wait till the grant period's over to do that. That's okay. the caveat. I see. Okay, you've, well, you've covered my question adequately. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and that is what I, I understand, don't know where we have people, the numbers, the attrition through retirement could compensate some of the six, but I just don't like knowing that it's a possibility we can't afford six and you, you hire somebody and there's, who's going to be the six that could possibly get cut? you know after four years well, i think you have to sign a contract saying this is a it's a temp position is guaranteed only through x amount well, of time and i understand it still bothers me that sure. you know you do a lottery system or i mean it just to to hire on for that i know in my profession traveling nurses you know you go somewhere for a certain amount of time and you move on not how sure how that works with fire and rescue so um and i do know that we have a lot of part-time people that work other areas 
which works in, and helps out. So that is my concern because that it, it's going to be a tax increase to get six. It's going to be a significant tax increase to get twelve. Well, I would say and I would just let me caveat this: if you're able to accommodate on the existing tax rates, it's not necessarily a tax increase. If we could put a hundred thousand a year aside cut other things or not grow other things as much and put a hundred thousand a year it's quite likely you could have four hundred thousand sitting aside to cover this without a tax increase so i i would just caveat it it's not a guaranteed tax increase if the economy grows well and, and that I, you're able I understand to that but we had a shortfall this year so we wouldn't have a hundred thousand to put aside for a rainy day because <clears throat> we were short to begin with so you can't put aside what you don't have. Mm -hmm. uh, I just don't like spending money I don't know I have. And, you know, it's, it's one thing to raise taxes. And, and I personally, if it's going for something like this, I don't so personally have a problem with it. The COVID here is the other elephant in the room that we don't know where we're going to be. So I, I lean toward the cautious side and it's not that I begrudge 12 people. I know, you know, that, but I just don't want to overburden the community when they're significantly burdened now. There's a lot of people that don't know. You look at the billboard on the movie theater, they're not sure if this keeps up, they're going to be able to open. That's revenue gone. That's another family, you know, that's struggling and the people that work there. So, I have to remember them as well. Um, so that's just my thoughts on it. Okay. Jim, let me, let me throw this in. Mr. Fox had a question a little while ago about a four years of reduction in the numbers of responses. And, you know, you all know I've been here 25 years, and I'll bet you I can count on one hand the years that we've had a reduction. We're getting an older. Uh, older citizenry we've we've got a large number of nursing homes that most of them are full and that uh, that uh, is an example of a lot of uh, emergency calls for us and i i really i've got to be a predictor uh, with the chance of hopefully being wrong i'd say in four years we're gonna we're gonna increase 20 percent minimum on, on the calls but of course I guess you, you keep that in mind right now, but that's something that you, uh, that, that you would uh, approach at the end of this, this grant cycle and then decide whether you wanted to keep those employees. Does this, does this grant come out again? It does. Okay. So you, you're, you're it's basically... A, it's, a, it's a yearly grant. The, I cannot find in the language of the grant the 70 pages of guidance associated with the grant that you cannot submit a grant I can't find where we can't ask for six this year and six next year what I can tell you is it's not heard of it being awarded so while I can't say you are and, and Brandy if you're still on the line help me if you've seen anything like that I can't find where you can't participate in this grant consecutive years I can't find another department that has not saying they haven't applied they just haven't been awarded six this year six the following year it's typically submit this year go through the three-year cycle then apply again go through the process again um, that's typically how it works because once you're you're awarded the grant um, you should be getting closer to meeting the NFPA standards that they want so your case is going to be weaker the next year to come back and request uh, they'd be more likely to look at people that haven't received the funding in a few years or have greater needs. Well, the other well, option we have is we can hire, as as our budget allows, hire a person a year. That that's mm -hmm. that's to me. You make your decision today because when you make your decision today, then we'll be able to fit that. If it's six or twelve, we'll be able to fit that into our overall long-term staffing plan that long-term staffing plan created in conjunction with the volunteer chiefs advisory committee and adopted by the previous board in that committee don't forget that calls for 26 people over five years well now we certainly understand that that number today with 
the COVID-19 may not be a realistic or achievable number based off of the economic status of our community, but we know that that's where we feel comfortable getting our staffing levels to to meet our calls for service, our projected growth in that calls for service. So when we say you're going to make a decision today, we'll work with Ms. Cullors as part of the Chief's Advisory Committee, the Volunteer Chief Staff, uh, the, the County Fire Chief's Office, and, and really creating and updating that document in light of that. But we'll be back before you asking for more staffing to meet our staffing needs. You know, we but that's that's going to be in the future. That's that'll be in the future. So don't don't forget that last year, for example, you approved six today. We said 15 last year, so we're already theoretically, you know, going to be behind the eight ball by nine positions versus what our need was last year. So that we, and that's why we created that staffing document was something for us to be able to work towards versus more or less throwing darts at the dartboard and figuring out how many we're going to hire this year. Now we understand the tough challenges that this body has to make we and you know I think I, I've told you each that if you approve six today the chief's going to do a cartwheel if you approve 12 he's going to do a cartwheel and a somersault you know so he's ecstatic with what you approve hope you can well, now, so. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm it okay. sounds good. <laughs> oh, so there goes your back yeah. <laughs> um, let me okay. go one more thing and I probably should keep my mouth shut before we go but I, I certainly don't mean this comment to beat anybody up or what have you, but we're struggling right now because of the COVID with volunteers. They're scared to death to come to the station uh, because they're, they're scared to death they're going to take something home to their family. Please, I understand that. <laughs> and that's not a scare tactic for you or whatever. That's a fact. And we can provide you those statistics. Um, we don't know where it's going to go. It could be another two years. It could be done in a, in a year. We, we really don't know. The bad part about it is we didn't have that knowledge when we put together the staffing plan for the department. We didn't have, you know, we, we knew volunteerism is hurting everywhere, but we didn't know how much, if that makes sense. And, and this plan, this, this staffing plan, not only addresses career positions, you know, so we even took an attempt to look at the long term. You know, we don't have a recruitment problem; we have a retention problem. And it, in my opinion, it is too easy for a conflict or a a argument within the confines of a station or internal politics or an internal strife. It is too easy for that volunteer with 15 years to get mad and walk away. It, and so what we envision is we're going to end up coming back to the board and tr maybe try to fund it with internal or split it with the board and that is looking at uh, a low SAP program that's what's called for in that staffing plan or a length of service awards program so like a volunteer retirement for our volunteer responders so so that can be fruitful um, you know in conjunction with bodies career staffing in the station how do we help support our volunteer system and keep them engaged and entertained? Um, you know, just on a side note, you know, we just took, uh, tonight will be the first time we're going to move our entry level. So we have suspended our training programs in light of the COVID-19. Well, if I'm an interested party because of COVID-19, I'm young, energetic, and I want to get into the, the volunteer fire department, I can't take the entry level programs to even start the process so tonight we're going to shift those programs to a virtual online learning type system so we can at least start that program so you have filled out that paper you are interested we need to engage you and keep you involved to get you in the door versus I've filled out that paper wait two months come talk to us when all this is over mm -hmm. we're going to lose a lot of interested parties so we're trying to make that shift as this virus progresses to meet the needs of the volunteer system so um, well I understand I'm just waiting that for the, chief um, to see us. the EMS side Perfect. of the volunteers mm -hmm. there is cautious and there are, I've heard that 
on the fire side, are they still responding to fire calls? Because it's uh, the exposure there is. Much I less. think there are some to to my not there are some responders that are engaging in fire response that are not engaging in EMS response. You still run that risk now because it's not just the EMS patients that you encounter well, I, I that are potentially that. affected. So there are some that said absolutely not. I'm done. Call me when it's over. There okay. are some that said I'm going to scale back on what I respond to. There are some that say I don't have family. I'm young, energetic, relatively healthy. I'm, gonna I, I'm just going to right. business as usual. So so we see it across the board. Uh, it has impacted our response system. Um, you know, we have others that are mandated by their employer, so their career somewhere else, and that employer has said, you're not allowed to volunteer. You know, so we, they're going to protect their employee and limit their activity outside of work to ensure that their continuity of operations is intact. So if I can limit your exposure outside of work, I can guarantee you're going to report to work. So we're seeing a mixed bag there. Uh, One of the things too that we we spread around, and because we have gotten a, a, an increased call load, is um, you might be on a fire truck at nine o'clock, and you're on the way back to the station at nine thirty, and you get an EMS call. So even people who aren't EMS trained are put on that uh, emergency scene. So. We had to go about training all these people with the N95s and and, uh, and the surgical masks and, and so forth too. But even that, telling them the truth, scares a lot of them to death. It scares me every day. But <laughs> we're not in the habit on the way back getting rid of the volunteers that aren't uh, trained. <laughs> yeah, we'll pick you up an hour. Wait here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any additional questions? Uh, we want to entertain a motion. Uh, well, I'm not real comfortable with with the 12, but I I would support going for the six on the the first proposed motion. But that's kind of where I'm, the way I feel about it. That's where I'm at. So am I. Well, if that's, I'll, I'll try that motion then, if you will, Mr. Chairman. I move that the Board of Supervisors authorize the General Services Director to submit on behalf of the Warren County Department of Fire and Rescue Services an application to FEMA's 2019 staffing for adequate fire and emergency response grant program seeking funding for six new full-time firefighter positions. Is there a second? I'll second that. Uh, any additional discussions? Mr. Common, Mr. Chair, I, I certainly appreciate um, the request, and we're all worried about the, the budget. Uh, I, my only caveat: I am worried about does it does it weaken our request? I know we missed out last year, um, and I'm hopeful that I don't want to go for the six and get zero when the 12 may or may not have made it a stronger application. But um, I support the board's direction, and uh, staff will work to get this thing. Uh, submitted and uh, hopefully we'll be successful because I think we all want to see uh, the Rivermont area have the staffing that other areas of our county have with with paid staff coverage. Additional well, discussion? Yeah, and and I think that once that Rivermont goes into to working order, I think it's going to be a benefit over, even over into uh, over into the west side of the county more so now. Than what they are have been all the way up to 55 and that right. absolutely yes sir it's a it's a critical need for the department I know like you said chief chief's gonna be happy with with the outcome and we appreciate the support of the board you don't get it off <laughs> and, and, and my uh, hope is with the opening of Rivermont it's it is going to be a beautiful facility not that you can't volunteer in an old dilapidated one if you have the passion to do that. But I'm hoping that the people that live here, volunteering with the fire and rescue is a wonderful experience. It has been for my family. And I just encourage people to, to try it. If it's not your thing, then that's fine. But you know, giving back to your community is, is wonderful. And it's, and it's an awesome thing to get involved in. Additional discussion? Emily, roll call, please. Mr. Carter. Mr. 
Mr. Carter. Ms. Oates? Aye. Mr. Maine? Aye. Ms. Colors? Aye. Mr. Fox? Aye. Mr. Carter? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, you're the you're the yeah, feedback guy. That. The phone yes. wasn't working. Yeah. Uh, yep. Um. I. Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries. Y'all want to slide? Please. Y'all want to slide the table out of the way? Chief will do his part. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it. Now. I'll do it. Probably say to him. Again, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Again, thanks on behalf of staff. Thank y'all for the support. And we'll uh, soldier on. Next item on our agenda is the general public comment period. The, the agenda public comment period is an opportunity for citizens to give input on issues on the board's agenda, which are not the subject of a public hearing and is not intended as a question and answer period. Emily, is, has anyone signed up? So no one submitted comments via email and I've done a couple of calls through the live chat as well and no one has made any comments so there is is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on this agenda final call the agenda public comment period is now closed Charlie, you want to read it? Well, I was w waiting for the go ahead here. Go ahead. <laughs> I always leap ahead too fast. I move the board enter into a closed meeting under the provisions of section 2.2-3711A1 of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act for the discussion or consideration of the assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, and resignation of a Pacific public officer of the public body. I further move that discussion be limited to the director of finance director position. Second. Mm -hmm. I. We're gonna do one at a time. Okay. You gotta do one at a time. Nope. No, you can Mr. go Fox, ahead and read. You, you seconded too I'll early. Second. Too early. She okay. Has, she, there's there's more. Okay, go ahead and read I, the second. I also part. move the board enter into a closed meeting under the provisions of section 2.23711A7 of the Freedom of Information Act for consultation with legal counsel pertaining to actual or probable litigation for which discussion be limited to the following two cases, Industrial Development Authority of the Town of Front Royal and the County of Warren, Virginia, AKA Economic Development Authority of the Town of Front Royal and the County of Warren versus Jennifer R. McDonald at all and Town of Front Royal Virginia versus Industrial Development Authority of the Town of Front Royal, Virginia, and the County of Warren, Virginia, AKA the Economic Development Authority of Warren County at all. Any discussion? Can I get a roll call, please? Mr. Fox? Aye. Ms. Colors? Aye. Aye. Can we please clarify that Mr. Fox is seconding that motion? Yes, he did. He, she, he did. And we, we did catch that. Also, there's, a, there's another case that um, we're talking about. I know you brought up the McDonald case, but there's another e EA case that we plan to talk about. Dan, could you name that? Mm -hmm. I, well, I might let you name that. Yeah, I can. It's uh, the Warren uh, Economic Development Authority versus TLC Settlements et al. That one is not on our list. Can we? Can you amend your motion, Ms. Colors, to okay. include that? I amend uh, the closed session motion to consider TLC okay. settlements. For settlements. Now, the easy thing to do, Mrs. Colors, is to say um, you will amend your motion to include uh, the case described by Mr. Seltzer. I amend my motion to the case that Mr. Seltzer described. And I'll second it. Thank you. Any additional discussion? Roll call, please. Mr. Fox. Aye. Ms. Colors. Aye. Mr. May. Aye. Ms. Oates. Aye. Mr. Carter. Aye. 
We're now in closed session. Um, please take uh, allow us to take about a 10 minute break. Hmm. Like it's going to talk to us. Yeah. 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 Ready? I'm ready. I move that the board certifies to the best of each member's knowledge only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements under sections 2.2-3711, A1, and A7 of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered in the meeting by the public body. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Mr. Carter? Aye. Ms. Oates? Aye. Mr. Main? Aye. Ms. Colors? Aye. Mr. Fox? Aye. We're now out of closed session. Is there any additional new business that, are, that we need to talk about? Hearing no new business, um, I, I, do I have a motion for adjournment? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor, roll call, please. Mr. Carter? 